Well, I encourage you to open your Bible this morning to Genesis chapter 24. You can find that on page 22 of the Black Gifts and Bible in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, you can take that Bible with you. Consider it our gift for you. We're walking through the book of Genesis chapter by chapter. This week we're in one of the longer chapters, chapter 24, where Isaac and Rebecca get married. This is the Word of God speaking directly to us this morning. Praise the Lord. It says this. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he came, made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of the evening, the time when women... Go to the draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young women, yet let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, Drink, and I will water your kids. Let her, let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar on her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all these camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, We have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord, and said, Blessed be the God, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out toward the man to the spring. As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, and heard the words of Rebekah and his sister, thus the man spoke to me, he went to the man. And behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels, and gave straw and fodder to the camels, and there was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. 
He said, Speak on. And he, so he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and to him he has given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord, before whom I have walked, will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son from my clan and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my clan. And if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the virgin who comes out to draw water, to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew water. I said to her, Please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar and her shoulder from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give your camels drink also. So I drank, and she gave camels drink also. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethel, Abor's son, from Milka, born to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms, and I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethel answered and said, the thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they rose in the morning, he said, Send me away to my master. Her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman remain with us a while, at least ten days. After that she may go. But he said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away, that I may go to my master. They said, Let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men, and they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from Merah Lahada Roy, and was dwelling in the, in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, this is your word. You inspired it. Use it in us. Help us to bow down and worship you when we recognize your authority in all things. Let us submit our lives to your sovereign hand in every detail of our lives so that we might be faithful, so our hearts might love you more. We ask this in your name. Amen. When you fly on an airplane, you don't just show up to the airport and say, let me on the plane. 
If you do that, you'll be thrown in prison. You just can't do that. You got to book a flight. You got to get the tickets. You got to reserve the seat, and you got to pay up front usually. And when you do that, you start planning your trip, don't you? Now it's no guarantee that you'll go on the trip. You can get sick. You have to cancel the trip. There could be something wrong with the plane. It still needs to be inspected, and on and on. These things happen to us. But still, there is a sense when you bought a plane ticket to go on a trip, you're planning to go. That's sort of. It's not completely, but that's sort of like what God's will is like happening here for Abraham, his servant. He's forecasted for him what the future is going to look like. But he still has to go. He's still got to make some plans. There, there's a means by which this, this future of what they hope God will accomplish will come true. But it's all through responsibility, isn't it? There's a harmony in Scripture. It's like a dance between God's sovereign will and human responsibility. We see it in this passage, dancing together, where God wills blessing, doesn't he? I mean, he's promised Abraham is going to give him the land. He promised that it's through his descendants they're going to become a great nation. This is, this, is, this is as sure as sure from the word of God. But there's also this responsibility that is not negated through Abraham's servant to fulfill the master's will. He's got to accomplish this. He still has to go. And so what he's doing is he's doing what Abraham has always called to do. He's walking by faith, isn't he? Walking by faith and not by sight. Faith is not just a New Testament idea. It's throughout the whole Bible. Where God's people are constantly called to walk by faith. And oftentimes it's not just blindly into the unknown. You know, I mean, they, they know nothing. They just have to go out there. A lot of times they're walking by faith because of what they know. I mean, they know really specific things about God's will. And yet they're still called to trust God by acting, by doing. Just as we are, as believers in Jesus. And so the main point that I really want us to soak in and apply from this passage this morning is to see how to trust God by means of responsibility. How are you trusting God by means of responsibility that God has given you to fulfill His will? That's the Christian life. And we're not going to walk verse by verse, or we'll be here till Christmas if we do that. But what we are going to do is we're going to look as we come through the verses to see how this is explained. But even more importantly, hopefully not just to see it, but to believe it, to trust it, to step into God's will in our own life by faith. So let's start with verse 1. Let's see this. God's sovereignty in the details. Verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. That's the header, isn't it? I mean, Moses is explaining loud and clear, if God has blessed Abraham in all things, then why wouldn't he continue to bless him? So in other words, God's in control of everything that we're about to see, even when it comes to Isaac finding a wife. So right off the bat, we have Moses communicating God's power. He's communicating God's plan. He's communicating God's grace in all the details of everything that's about to happen. And the same is true of us. When you think about your own Christian faith, if, if you're a believer in Jesus, just think about how your life has been blessed by Christ. All things have been blessed by Christ. The good things, the bad things, Jesus anoints us with his grace, even through trial. You when you think about what Scripture says about trial for the Christian, like in Romans 8.28, it says, For those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are, it says, called according to His purpose. That's a pretty particular calling right there, isn't it? The calling upon the Christian life is a calling where our whole lives are blessed by God because if God can remove all the barriers of sin that stand between us and Him, what can He do in your life? Faith is a supernatural gift of God. If God can regenerate our hearts from hearts of rock, hard stone, that's the unbelieving heart. It's like when the gospel gets thrown like seed upon it, it just bounces right off. If God can change you from a heart of stone and give you a heart that's like good soil, when you hear the gospel, it's planted deep and it starts growing a life of righteousness, if He can bless you with that, what can He bless you in? God can bless us in all 
things. And it's by the power of the gospel we see that evident. His sovereignty is touching our lives from the inside out so that every part of our lives are blessed by him. He's done the same thing for Abraham. Verse 2. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife or my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. So I don't want to get into graphic here or anything, but okay, so you got to imagine. So he's putting his hand, right, under his thigh. But how do I look? It's weird, right? I mean, I would not want any of you dudes to put your hand there. You know what I mean? And this is, right, why is he doing that? Well, he, he's doing that because, you know, it, it's around the loins area, isn't it? Because there's a blessing that's supposed to come from Abraham. Right? It's through his descendants. It's through his seed that the hope of the gospel is going to bless the nations. This is how Genesis 3.15 is going to become true. Where the seed of the woman will come and crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And God will destroy death forever for all people. For all time, across the whole earth. That's the blessing. So he wants his servant to understand this and to swear by what God has already promised to fulfill this blessing. Because God can do it. And so he swears this will happen. But there's a means, isn't there? So the promise is that through Abraham's descendants, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. But there's still a means that that has to be accomplished through. And so the servant picks up the means, doesn't he? And he goes. And he's looking for this, this woman. He wants the, the final wife for Isaac. And he vows to do this. And God's going to have to work it out. Because at the end of the day, Abraham doesn't want someone to be a Canaanite. So we see this in verse 8, don't we? It says... But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So, so in other words, he can go back to his homeland because he doesn't want a Canaanite wife to be taken for Isaac. But he doesn't want Isaac to stay where he's from. Why? Because God promised the promised land. So the Canaanites are dwelling there, but they're not the ones promised the land. It's Abraham who's promised that land. And so he doesn't want Isaac to stay back. He's going to have to come if, if this isn't going to work out. So you can see the responsibility, can't you? This human responsibility. Some things might not work out. But the, the whole point is Abraham still has to trust God. And so does the servant. He has to keep believing. So in all of these details and all the decisions, there's still a faith that God will still provide for Isaac even if there's a woman not willing to. Do you have that kind of faith? Even if it doesn't work out, you're still going to do it. God calls us to share the gospel, right? That's His will. What if you share the gospel and no one turns and believes in Jesus? What are we going to do? Well, we're not going to stop sharing the gospel. And we're not going to stop going. Faith perseveres. What about relationships? Relationships break down really quickly, don't they? Because of conflict and chaos and sin and all kinds of things. Hard hearts. We're still called to be reconciled. So what if you try to be reconciled through confessing your sin, repenting, and believing, but yet it's still not working out? What are you going to do? Well, hopefully you keep persevering. You keep pursuing reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible calls us ambassadors of reconciliation. That's God's will. That's His plan. But it takes faith to continue pursuing that. All of us have opportunities each and every day to be exercising a persevering Hey, and so this is what Abraham wants him to do. His servant has got to keep having persevering faith to find Isaac the right woman. And so eventually in verse 10, we see that the servant goes, doesn't he? Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he rose and went to Mesopotamia, the city of Nahor. So that's Abraham's brother. So he's being faithful. He's going to the, the family of Abraham to look for the wife. And then he finally gets there. We see in verse 12 what he does. The first thing he does when he gets there. And he said in verse 12, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today 
and show steadfast love to my master. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Okay, so what's going on here? The first thing he's doing is he's praying. Now you can ask the question, well, why is he praying? The angel of the Lord's going before him. Abraham's already told him that God can work this out. Again, it's means, isn't it? God's using prayer to execute his sovereign will. That's what we see happening. And it's not just, you know, he, he's ignorant or something. He's, he's well-intentioned and he has full knowledge of what God can do. But it's the full knowledge of God that's causing him to pray. I think sometimes we pray because we just think to ourselves, well, we just don't know, you know, what God's going to do or what God wants. And so we just have to pray. We should pray knowing what God wants. We, we know what God's will is in Scripture. He's made it real clear. But that's why we pray. Prayer is a means by which God carries out His will. Because God's always hard at work through our prayers, isn't He? I mean, this is the predicament of every Christian. So every Christian has been tasked with doing something that we can't accomplish on our own. Have you thought about that? So the servant has to go and obey the master. But he's got to do something that on his own he can't do. He's, he's going to have to... Get help. The Lord's going to have to come through. We're the same way, aren't we? When we're walking with Jesus through this journey of life, and we're facing challenge after challenge after challenge, we, we're called to raise the dead. I mean, have you thought about this? I mean, we're called to do what only God can do through us. We can try our best to love people with the love of Christ, but that doesn't mean that we're the ones who save them, right? God has to save them. God's the one where He says He brings them into the kingdom. Makes them a child from a child of darkness to a child of light. Citizens of the king. I can't do that. You can't do that. But what's the means? The means is us. It's proclaiming the gospel. It's showing Christ-like love. And the same is true in relationships. Sometimes there are, there are opportunities we have to do ministry. But the ministry we do together in the local church is a ministry that at the end of the day only God can accomplish. God is the one who's going to have to bless the ministries. God's the one who's going to have to move. He's the one who's going to have to have the power of the Spirit in and through us so that His will comes down and is done through our ministries. But what's the means? Well, it's our prayers, isn't it? It's how we work together. It's how we love each other. It's how we're called to obey all of the imperatives of the local church throughout all the Bible. And there are many if you come through the New Testament. It's through the means of all that that God's will becomes very evident. And God does what only God can do. And if you notice, too, something that's really interesting about what Abraham's servant's doing is he doesn't just show up on the scene and say, well, God's just going to have to do it. Lord, you just going to have to do it. And then he sort of just, you know, goes out to eat or something like that, right? He, he goes to the place where the maidens are going to come to draw water. So he's using his faculties. He, he's using wisdom here. It would be the same, you know, we just don't get in our cars, right? And we say to ourselves, Lord, keep me safe when I drive down the road. We don't buckle our seatbelt. Like, we're we're going to buckle our seatbelt, especially with the police officers around here. I mean, right? I mean, they, they're going to get you, you know? I mean, they're quick. I was actually, no, I mean, anyway. <laughs> One of them had binoculars in the car that I saw, and I was like, these guys are weak, you know? I thought about that. It's true. And the same is true, you know, um... With anything, you know, if you've been experiencing an addiction to something, you don't say, Lord, just set me free from this addiction, and yet you still go to a place where you're tempted. You're just not going to do that. So there's a wisdom that's being exercised here by Abraham's servant to see God's sovereign hand in the details. Use your faculties in decision making. God has given them to you. He's given us reason. He's given us common sense. He's given us wisdom to use for His good. We don't have to just step blindly into the dark. Think about where this happened with the disciples. Jesus with the disciples was so clear about his will in Matthew 16. He told them he was going to die, and on the third day he was going to rise from the dead. So they knew the future. He would explained it to them. And yet it still took faith because they have to live it, don't they? They've got to walk through that, and that was really difficult for the disciples. Super hard. I think many of us, that God, God would just lay out the future for us, we'd be fine. You know, I like to think that. He would just lay out all the details of what would happen. I can just walk through the details and 
Everything's going to be fine. That's not faith. It, it takes faith with the knowledge of God's will to do that well. Same is going to be true for you graduates. You know, I was thinking about you through this. When I was graduating from high school, just know this. I spent 14 years in higher education. That's way more already. You know, I'm, I'm going on the like, this might be the dark path. You know, that I'm <laughs> where I'm never going to be able to get out. But that's how much more education that I've had after I graduated high school. That's it. Is that crazy? It's like scary, right? And when you think about the decisions that have to be made along that path, and you're seeking God's will in that, it takes faith. God's just not going to lay it out. You wish He would. You wish everything would just be laid out nice and clean. That's not going to be. That's okay. Keep trusting Him. You know, the passage of Scripture that I think about a lot, Proverbs 3, where it says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. That's our deal. Trust the Lord with all your heart, deacons. Trust the Lord with all your heart, lay leaders. Trust the Lord with all your heart, church members. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. That's hard! Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. That's what it says. Do that. I love history. Minor in history. It was easier for the classes. But I love it. Because I love stories. It's so easy for historians to look back on history and just critique it. Because the cliche is true, isn't it? Hindsight's always 2020. Foresight. Boy, that's really hard to see. But what might God have us see for the future? And how might God want us to use our faculty and our wisdom that He has given to us, the reasonableness? I think of Philippians, Paul said, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. It, it was reason, be able to work together to see that future come to pass because we're trusting in the Lord. What's the future of FBC look like? We have to be able to talk about that together. What's it look like in your own life, in your walk with the Lord? What does it take for us to be able to step in faith into that future? It takes prayer, doesn't it? It takes a swell of humility. It takes working together to help one another do that well. It takes wrestling through Scripture together, doesn't it? So that together we can understand in a loving way what God has for us to accomplish by His will. The church should be a place that helps one another seek the Lord's will together. Don't you think? I mean, I, I, that's so easy to take for granted. But if we're not helping one another seek the Lord's will together, then where are we supposed to go to seek the Lord's will? The church should be a place for Christians to come and they're just condemned instantly for a thought they have about God's will from the Bible. This should be a place of love and grace because we are all hashtag finite, right? We are. Never underestimate the power of finiteness. We don't know everything perfectly. I certainly don't. I need you. You need me. We need to work together to be able to love one another with grace and truth, to talk about what God's will is. You know, it is a shame, isn't it, whenever we find more grace talking about God's will from the Bible with not believers than we do from Christians. If there's anyone who should know God's grace, it's us. So let's show it. Let's, let's enjoy showing it. Do you enjoy showing grace to other believers? Well, shouldn't we not? We should love it. We drink deeply from it, don't you? Every morning when you get up, God's mercies are new for us every morning. I think about that all the time. Every morning when you get up, and it's a thundercloud around here. So we can't get the sun to shine. I tell you what, I think God's mercies are new every morning, man. Drink it in. Love it. Let's be merciful. I need mercy. So do you. Let's be gracious. Let's work together to find that. So he prays. We're on prayer, Madison. Now verse 15. Before he had finished speaking. Don't you wish your prayers were answered like that? Mine aren't. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebecca, who was born to Bethel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor. So, I mean, this is it. This is the gal. 
This is the one who, she meets the profile. Abraham's brother came out with her water jar on her shoulder. I mean, man, this is, I mean, the, the sun is rising on God's will in the servant's life. I mean, he is seeing this, and it's just, it's just loud and clear. So Rebecca approaches the well, and he's wanting her to water the camels. You know, and that would be unusual, because it takes so long. So normally they would give water to the strangers, but to water the camels would probably give her, you know, in tune with this. Something more is going on here with this individual. Because that would take forever. It would take a ton of water. I know it says she went and put water in the trough. Listen, it, it would take a lot of trips to do that. And it's hard pulling water in there. So she's going and she's doing that. And then he sees in this exchange the uniqueness of Rebecca and how she really is fulfilling what he had prayed to the Lord for. And so eventually he gives her the bracelet, he gives her the nose ring, which would be common. It, it, it's a way of continuing the dialogue with her about what this might mean for her to be taken as a wife. So she draws the water, and then she welcomes them into her home, doesn't he? And in all of this, what the servant sees is he sees the Lord's providence. And then the whole story this whole story is actually repeated again in verse 34. Did you catch that? Why? Why is it repeated again? It's because Moses is driving it home. All of this is from God. In case you've missed it up to this point, God has been at work in all the details of this. And Laban and Bethel recognize this providence in verse 50, don't they? So go to verse 50. It says, Then Laban and Bethel answered and said, the thing has come from the Lord. There it is. I mean, that is the declaration of all that has just transpired. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. There it is. And Abraham's servants, they respond accordingly, don't they? Look at verse 52. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. How do you respond to God's sovereignty? When you recognize God's providence at work, what's your response? It's kind of like learning to drive a car. You know, I was thinking about this. When you turn 16, I don't know what the age is around here. But you learn how to drive a car, and your parents hand you the keys for the first time. They've warned you ad nauseum, you know, about the dangers of driving. You've gone through the books, you've taken the class, you pass the test, and you get the keys in your hand. You take off driving. Car, you know what I'm talking about. And you're alone. And you think to yourself, one of a few things. One thing you can think while you're driving is, I'm pretty awesome. I mean, look at me. Here I am. I've got the keys of the kingdom here. I've been given good authority that I can do this. And you're just driving along and you're wanting everyone to just pay attention to your driving skills. You interpret the road signs the best. You understand the playbook well. Watch me. I'm doing awesome. Here I go. There it is, Everett. You knew it was coming. Because that's what happens. You crash and you burn. That's one way to respond. You know, another way you could respond is you could respond and say, Oh, I'm not going to drive. Why aren't you going to drive? Well, oh, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to drive. Oh, he's, he's afraid. Mom, yeah, he's, you know, they, she's afraid. You can't drive. Or you could say, Well, I'm not going to drive. You know, I, I, I haven't studied the road book very well. I don't know the manual. Oh, they don't know the manual completely. You know, they need to. But you can say, I, I just don't see a need to drive. I'm just not going to drive. Not, what, do I, what do I need to do? Well, you need to pick up your sister. You know, <laughs> and your sons, my, my kids. You know, your sisters and brothers. That'd be great. I just don't see a need. You go pick up some groceries for me. I don't see a need. You keep saying that. Why are you saying that? It's just pride, isn't it? But it's another form of it. So it's a manipulation, too, isn't it? Because then who has to drive everywhere? You got it. Someone else. Well, okay, well, I'll have to drive you again. Well, here I go. You can't learn to drive? Or you can bow to authority humbly. You can accept it on good authority. How to walk with God circumspectly, pointing people to Him, helping accomplish His will, 
not your own. Even though it's going to be difficult, you're helping God's efforts prosper, not our own efforts. That's how we should be responding to God's providence. We need to be bowing down. And so, after they bow down, what happens after all this? Well, they receive Becca, don't they? They receive Rebecca, she's willing to go, and she's welcomed, isn't she, into God's kingdom. You can see this in verse 59. It says this, it says, So they went away, Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebecca, and they said to her this, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. So here you see right here, she receives the blessings of the kingdom. So she's included now in this great narrative of God redeeming the world. But now she recognizes on some level through this blessing that it's going to be through her. It's through her. And the greatest enemy she's going to have is the seed of the serpent. And that's what you have to trace as you continue reading Genesis. Is how is the seed of the serpent, Satan's offspring, going to be crushed? It's going to be through her in some way, shape, or form. But this is what we need to be thinking about when we think about us being included in God's kingdom. Because if we're going to participate as well and be included in what God is doing, it's going to take a submission to God's sovereign hand in every detail about how His will comes about in His group. And it's going to take a humility that's willing to trust in His promises at great cost to ourselves, to trust in His promises when they rub against our feelings, to trust in His promises even when circumstances around us are crashing and burning. How are we going to do that? Every time we submit ourselves to God's sovereign will and the details of life with faculty, with wisdom, with action, with prayers, with volition, God always, always, always promises to spread the power of His salvation through us. It happens every time. Every time. Sometimes in little ways, sometimes in big ways. Every time God's people submit to His authority, He's always doing good things to spread the power of His salvation, the promises of the gospel through us. That's something you can just bank on to guarantee. You know, my kids, they like to get on my good side a lot because they know if we get on Dad's good side, He'll promise us ice cream. They love ice cream because it's getting to be 100 degrees outside. They know that's going to happen, but what happens sometimes is I say, no. No ice cream tonight. What's that pie instead? No. Really <laughs> Something else, right? The promises of God that spread salvation are so much surer than anything we promise our children. They're guaranteed to those who are humble and happy to follow through on God's will and our own. So what are God's promises? It's so important, isn't it? Back row up there, you still with me? It's so important. What are God's promises that we should be banking on as we step out in faith to accomplish His will? There are many. God promises to never leave you. No matter what you experience, to never leave you. It was so encouraging whenever I was at the open house for Robert and Sharon. It was awesome. It was a good time. One of the things that made it so good is it was you were looking through the pictures and hearing stories about from their family and friends about what happened to them on the journey, one of the things you could pinpoint with each and every story is God's love, God's presence, God's power. Never leave them, always with them, anointing their lives. That's what you want to anoint in your life. That's what I want to anoint in mine. God promises to never leave you. He's always standing by you. God promises to always intercede for you. Don't you need an intercessor? What if you had to stand before the judge today? Guilty of something you committed. When you want so much for someone to stand and intercede for you, that's exactly what Jesus did. We stood before God condemned by our sin, by our lack of love for one another, by our pride. And Jesus stepped in and said, don't condemn them. I'll take the punishment. I'll take the blame. I'll stand in and he continues interceding for us with prayer. He's always going to. And the Bible says that Jesus intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. That's how much he's on your side. It's a tremendous promise of the gospel. 
God promises to forgive you and wash you clean of all sin. Sometimes our baby Bree, she's out there in the dirt and she plays so much that when she finally comes in, I can't get all the dirt off. And I'm scrubbing. You know, every nook and cranny. And then whenever I lay her down, there's dirt behind her ear. Man, can't get this girl clean. Jesus washes all our sin. Completely clean, spotless. It's, you know what? It's not just as if you're clean. It's as if your skin never got dirty. That's how clean and pure and righteous Jesus cleanses you. If you trust Him, if you love Him, if you want Him to save you. God promises to satisfy us with His love. You thought about that? The world is constantly trying to pick us apart so that our hearts are satisfied in something other than God. I mean, this just is happening. It's the air we breathe. They're trying to get our dollars. They're trying to get our affections. They're trying to get our, our marriages. The world is trying in every way to make us happy with something other than God. God promises over and over again, His love will satisfy you. Let His love satisfy you. Drink deeply of the love of God for you in Christ. Know what it means. Be satisfied by His love. God promises to always be able to keep you from stumbling. That's the prayer in Jude. At the end, God is able to keep you from stumbling. Do you feel like you're going to stumble? Maybe you're going to stumble theologically. Maybe you're going to stumble relationally. God has the power to keep you from stumbling. You have to trust Him. You have to be humble and submit to Him. And then finally, God promises this. God promises you and me that we will be raised from the dead. Let that change you. Your life on this earth might be short. I had a dear friend who was a member of my old church die two days ago. Unexpectedly. He was shot. And the hope I have of seeing him again at the resurrection. That's the hope. None of us know what our last day is going to be. I know that's cliche. But what are you banking your eternity on? If we bank it on being raised from the dead, think about how that transforms our day-to-day -day lives. All of a sudden we go from temporal to eternal in our perspective of all things. All because of the promise that God makes to us. We will be raised from the dead. So these are the promises. There are a few, aren't they? And God wants to multiply them in our lives so that we can help others know God's will and then fulfill that will by way of responsibility through prayer, through words, through actions, ultimately through submission to what God has already ordained. Let's help one another do that. I'm going to pray for us. And as I pray, I'm going to ask the servants to come forward. We can sit over here on the front of the Lord's Supper. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, be glorified. I just pray right now that you be cutting through hardness of heart. Provide conviction. Like only you can, through the power of your word, to give us a hope that is eternal, that's willing to do hard things for your sake and for your kingdom's purposes. Give us a grace that only you can provide as we seek to do your will, not our own will. I just pray right now that you would be replacing the will we have for our lives with your will. Make us mindful of how we might be more obedient to you. We pray in your name. Amen.